Um, our first speaker this evening is Graham Appleton. So Graham, if you would like to share your screen, um, I might introduce you while you get set up. Okay, magic. So Graham is the author of the popular blog, um, Wader Tales, which is read by wader and shorebird enthusiasts all around the world. Um, he takes newly published research papers and he works with their authors to promote um, understanding and, and conservation of this increasingly threatened group of birds. And Graham, in his own words, was bitten by the wader bug back in 1974 when he met the late Clive Minton and other members of the Walsh Wader Ringing Group. And during his first career as a teacher, um, bird watching was more of a hobby for Graham, but it became part of his job when he started working um, for the British Trust for Ornithology in 1997. And there he served as Director of Communications until he took an early retirement at the end of 2013. And since then he's shifted focus more toward writing um, and occasionally broadcasting. And he's also the current treasurer of the British Ornithologists Union. Um, and tonight he's going to be speaking about the conservation challenges and success stories for a few of the shorebird species um, that have been such a big part of his life among them curlews and godwits. So Graham, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Um, over to you. Thank you very much, Karis. Uh, it's uh, a real pleasure to do this. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Uh, I am somewhat overawed by one or two of the uh, people who are watching this. This is not going to be a really deep way to story. Uh, it's designed for anybody who's interested in wildlife. Uh, it, uh, and it, I'm certainly Although I am a passionate waderologist, uh, none of the research is mine. I'm just a writer. So a great place to start is a 2020 review by a very good friend, Thomas Gunnison, who writing in Wader Study, which is the journal of the Wader Study Group, or International Wader Study Group as it now is, uh, talked about some of the ways that waders are losing space. Now he was particularly talking about breeding waders, uh, but as I go through this, I'm afraid that I'm going to expand a little. So waders are losing space in many ways. Uh, one of the ways they're doing it is by the fact that the tree line is moving north as, as our climate warms up, as our planet warms up. A lot of the migratory shorebirds, and it's migratory shorebirds that I'm going to be talking about, a lot of the migratory shorebirds are uh, having to find more space uh, further north because they're losing out on space that's now becoming forested. And the same with palmated sandpiper is, is one of those species. Anybody who thinks that bill looks a little bit short, uh, same with palmated sandpiper in the west, which is where this was taken, have tiny little bills. Uh, the next uh, thing that's happening is that, of course, waders, like every other species on this planet, is losing space because we take it away. Uh, and uh, the snipe, as uh, one of the birds that likes rough, wet uh, places, uh, loses it out when those places become warm enough uh, to be farmed. Another species that's losing out in a different way is the, uh, that's a Hudsonian godwit. And here I'm straying away a little from breeding waders uh, and talking about, in fact, uh, what Americans would call a shorebird. Uh, and uh, the, the Hudsonian godwit is, is losing out because young birds, teenage birds, birds that haven't as yet started to breed, um, have uh, been found to be using the pampa wetlands of Argentina, which are really great for growing soybean. Uh, so soy, uh, which is uh, the main crop in that area, uh, is taking over from Hudsonian godwits. So we've got uh, a warming climate, we've got greedy people, uh, we have food being grown largely to feed animals, to feed us. Uh, we also have uh, the emergence of this forestry policy which is being used in a very strange way. So forests are being planted, uh, both uh, to provide building materials, but also to burn um, and also to capture carbon. Uh, and it, when, they, when they are planted in patches like this, they take away large swathes of uh, wader breeding habitat. And just an example of another way that waders are getting squeezed, I think we all know that our coasts are particularly under pressure, uh, particularly uh, estuaries, uh, these muddy spots look really great for developing the next high-rise building or putting in the next port or uh, the next factory uh, set up or perhaps industrial cockling or all sorts of things. Uh, these look like spare spaces that can be used by people. 
So just to give an example of how this lack of space is affecting species, uh, this is uh, a baby curdew, a Eurasian curdew, uh, and this is one in fact in Ireland. And what we found over in Ireland in the last few years since the uh, 1970s, 1980s, uh, is that we have lost 96%, so that's all but 4% of the breeding curdew have been lost from Ireland. It's not just an Irish story, as you can see in the figures at the top, they're also being lost from Wales and from Scotland and from England. Uh, and this is just uh, in the British Isles, they're also being lost from Poland and from other countries, uh, Germany and uh, lots of other countries too. And the problem with uh, curdew is they're big birds which require a lot of space. And that's one of the things we're finding is that the waders that need the most space, the waders that need the most space, are also the waders that seem to be declining significantly. Uh, and you can read about that in Irish birds. I talked about 96% decline of Ireland's curly, but in fact, they're not really very far, down, far up the threatened list. At the top, Eskimo curly, which I believe to be extinct, slender bill curly, which is functionally extinct if it isn't properly extinct. Uh, Far Eastern uh, curdy, which is the one that flies uh, from Russia down to Australia, uh, in endangered. Bristleside curdy, which uh, winters on the Pacific Islands and flies north in the spring, is vulnerable. And there you see the Eurasian curdy, but also Bartel goldwood and Blacktail goldwood. And if you look at the six species at the bottom, although they say they're at least concerned, I don't think any serious waderologist would actually believe they are of no concern. Here in Britain, uh, we see a direct effect of climate change, not just space being taken away from waders. Uh, we see the doctoral as uh, Ron Summers, who's one of, in the audience and making me very nervous. Uh, as Ron Summers would know, uh, the, the doctoral is moving uphill as, uh, as our temperature warms up and the, the window that they have for breeding is at the very top of our very highest mountains in Britain uh, and, and the doctoral is being lost. Uh, I'll put a link to uh, a blog about doctoral into, the, uh, to, into a Twitter thread that I'll put together after this, because actually it's a complicated story. Although they are moving uphill, the reason for the decline seem to be based in uh, climate change in Africa. So we have waders doing very badly uh, in many places. So what are we doing? What are we doing as scientists? What are scientists doing to try to understand and what is happening to uh, waders like blacktail godwit or in this case. So we're, we're, doing, we're trying to provide a helping hand. We're trying to provide a helping hand by better understanding the uh, way that uh, birds use space. Uh, we want to know, are they producing enough chicks? Are they living long enough? Um, do chicks turn from chicks into breeding adults? Uh, and there's lots of detailed research going on. This is the Project Godwit team in Eastern England. I could have shown you the same pictures of wader biologists working in the Netherlands or in Iceland or in Greenland or in Canada or the United States or Russia or all the other countries that these migrating waders move to. The other thing that is happening is that we are trying to protect the wetlands that waders use during the breeding season. Uh, and as I say, I'll put a series of links into the Twitter thread to this, but this is uh, Bernie Marshes, which is in Eastern England again. Uh, and you can see how this former agricultural land, uh, which was uh, used for grazing cattle, is still being used for grazing cattle, but in a way that allows the farmer to store winter water for summer use, but also allows for plenty of space for breeding waders. Uh, breeding waders take their chicks to the edge of, uh, uh, of muddy ditches and to the edge of pools and you can see just how much edge habitat has been created by this very imaginative scheme to both support farmers, support conservation and actually in this case also to reduce winter flooding. The good thing about waders, if you're a wader biologist, is that they can wait a little while if we can't get our act together. Uh, the, the fact is that a species like a, a, an oyster catch can live for 40 years, a curly, the Eurasian curly for 30 years, uh, turnstone for 20, and uh, even the dunlin for almost 20 years. So these species can live a long time. 
So if we can get our act together and produce the right habitat for them to breed in, then in two or three very good years, they can actually bounce back significantly. And all we have to do is to provide the habitat they need uh, and they can do the rest. And just to indicate that this can happen, even naturally, uh, here's a graph of black-tailed godwit. Now, there are very few black-tailed godwit breed in England. Uh, if you look at this graph, you'll see that in some years, back in 1993, to me, it looks like about 18 pairs nested in England. And that trebled over the course 1999 to 2006, uh, just by good habitat management work and a few good years. And it's those that red arrow gives people a lot of hope. If we can just get things right, then in a few years, waders can really bounce back. One of the ways that we are adding that extra help, uh, again, for these black-tailed goldwoods, is to head start individuals. Now, anybody who was around for the talk on spoonbill or the series of talks on spoonbill sandpipers will know that there are only about 600 uh, spoonbill sandpipers left in the world. Uh, they are traveling from Russia down to uh, the Asian coast, uh, and uh, they, they have been head started to increase the number. That means taking eggs, raising them to become chicks, releasing the chicks, and letting them do what they would do naturally and join the wild population. And that's been happening with black-tailed godwits based on the spoonbill sandpiper model, and is also now happening for curdew. So again, once we can get the habitat right, we can give birds a boost and it can make a real difference. The problem is that it's not just the breeding season. Uh, this very schematic diagram just illustrates some of the waders that come to Britain and Ireland during the winter time. Um, and they're coming from a vast area to a strangely warm bit of uh, coastline, uh, warmed by the uh, warm waters coming north in the Gulf Stream. So it's ridiculously warm at these latitudes compared to almost anywhere else. If you look at uh, London, uh, London is on about the same latitude as the bottom of James Bay, bottom of Hudson Bay in Canada. Uh, so people in Scotland are on the same latitude um, as breeding polar bears in Canada. So we have waders coming to our shores because they're so warm and we're a long way north. And you see where they all come from. And this is one of the problems that I've been talking about black tail godwits and how we can help their breeding numbers. But how do we help species which are traveling such very long distances uh, where they require so many different habitats during the course of their lives? And especially as it's so complicated. Uh, here's just one way to, uh, that uh, we know quite a lot about now, thanks to the work of Jeroen Renierkins, who has been working in Zachenberg up in Greenland. And you can see from this graph uh, from the map on the right hand side, that sandling spend their winter at anywhere between Scotland and Namibia, in fact South Africa as well, but there hasn't been a big study population down there so they're not on the map. But Ghana, Mauritania, Portugal, France, all of those different places are the winter home to birds from the same spot. So not only do birds travel long distances and in covering many countries, different individuals have completely different strategies uh, which they then adopt for the rest of their lives. And this is important to the sandling. It's a great paper. Again, I'll put the link in, uh, in my uh, Twitter thread. But if you look at the probability of annual survival, if a bird spends the winter in England, the chance of it dying in a particular year is just one in six. If it spends the winter in Ghana, it's one in four. So what that means is that if a bird chooses Ghana for its winter location, it's doing much worse than birds that decide to winter in England on average. Not only are they surviving less well in Mauritania and Ghana, in these equatorial closer, countries closer to the equator, they're also uh, less likely to migrate north in their first year and when they do migrate, they migrate later. So they arrive back in Greenland later. So there are three things against them when it comes to being successful. They have fewer breeding attempts, they start later, uh, and their survival rate is lower. And if you look at Namibia at the bottom there, it isn't just closeness to Greenland. The birds that travel to Namibia are doing just as well as the ones that stay in France. What that means, and, and then the, you can see from that yellow dotted line what their migratory route is. So 
it's really complex looking after waders because they do such different things. And one of the interesting things here is happenstance. A bird, a juvenile sandling that spends its first winter in Scotland will do that every year. One that does go to Nim Namibia will do that every year. A bird that spends Christmas in Mauritania has no idea that it's a rubbish place to be. Uh, and that is a really fascinating fact. You might see a flock of birds in Mauritania and assume that Mauritania is good for sandling. But in fact, when you do the sums, you find it's not. So, firstly, lots of species go down. Secondly, try to help them is complex. But the third thing is that it's not all species everywhere that are declining. Black-tailed godwit, again, those species that, uh, that were, I talked about a little earlier, the main uh, breeding ground for the Limosa black-tailed godwit is in the, ne in the Netherlands, where they've seen a 75% decline in numbers since the 1970s. On the other hand, if you look at the north of the range, where the Icelandica breed in Iceland and where the Limosa breed in Russia, in both places, we see that the burns are spreading into new areas. They're spreading into new areas because the climate is warming up and more places are becoming more suitable to them. And we can see how that opportunism works when you look at the graph of the number of wintering black-tailed godwits in the United Kingdom. These are Iceland birds that come to, uh, come to the United Kingdom to the winter, but also to uh, Ireland and to Western Europe. And you can see that index there that is basically shows that since the 19, since about 1980, the number of black-tailed godwits has gone up by a factor of eight. So that is not, uh, that's not just the fact that there are more wintry here, there are obviously more black-tailed godwits. So warmer springs are enabling birds to breed earlier and more successfully in the south of Iceland, but also to spread into new areas which are now suitable to them to breed because they're warmer, the grass growth is getting going earlier, the insects are there for them earlier, and there is a big enough window in which they can, uh, in which they can uh, breed. And again, I'll put the links into the Twitter feed which I will develop over the next 24 hours. Don't expect it all to be there tonight. So this generation, this new generations of black-tailed goldwits are actually learning to adapt to new conditions. And that's really important. The graph at the top shows that if you look at the year of hatching along the bottom and the arrival dates in Iceland in the spring, you can see that birds that were hatched back in 93, 94, uh, used to return much early, uh, much later than birds that have been hatched in recent years. So with these warmer springs, the, year, the uh, arrival date back in Iceland of new generations of black tar godwits is getting earlier. Those 93 and 94 and 95 birds never change their arrival date. So once you've picked an arrival date in Iceland, you stick to it. Uh, there are reasons for that. Uh, you'll have to read up the background for that. But what's happening is as new generations come along, they're dragging migration earlier. Not only are they dragging migration earlier, they're also uh, changing migratory patterns. So these, yo these young birds, these new birds, even when they become old new birds, they still did the same. They have new patterns of migration. They're wintering in new areas and they're basically taking the species, or in this case, the subspecies, into new areas. Now that's fine. Again, there, there's the paper and I'll put the link later. That's fine. These are, these are juvenile black-tailed godwits about to head off from Iceland and, and a juvenile red shank. Uh, from Iceland about to head south in, in, in August, September, this would have been taken and they'll be leaving the country over the next three or four weeks after that. Th this is fine. This is adaptable. This is really coping with climate change in a really positive way. But the key thing is the juveniles are being produced and they're the birds that are changing the patterns. In species like the curly, where youngsters are not being produced, it's more difficult for birds to, as a, as a species or as a subspecies, to adapt to changing habitats. Imagine those curlews in, in Ireland being still in the same places that they were 20 years ago, even though they're rubbish places to breed. 
So how can we make a difference? Well, one of them is to uh, keep studying waders. Uh, and when you've studied the waders is to understand what the key refueling stations are for species like these red knot and uh, turnstone in uh, here in Delaware Bay. But it's not just about finding out the science. You then have to do something with that science. And that is where the wader world is so wonderfully blessed. I'm going to my notes now because otherwise I'm going to forget stuff. Because people can make a difference. So the best wader conservation, the best conservation depends on teamwork and it depends on people who want to tell people about their work. Here's the late great Clive Minton, enthusing about shorebirds. It's such an important thing to do is to enthuse about your study species. Here's Jenny Gill, my wife, talking to a group of bird watchers about her black tail godwits. Here's Turnis Piersma giving yet another of his TV presentations about his work on knot or black tail godwit or whatever today's species is. And then in the background, the really important people, uh, David Stroud and uh, Nicola Crockford, talking, uh, attending endless boring meetings to make sure that the science is turned into policy uh, for conservation. That's really important. So there's a, there's a whole story here, but if you look at this, how science can inform policy, and that's what wader biologists are so good at, is that scientists produce papers, the scientists, NGOs, and individual governments work together to produce conservation proposals, and then you need national in, and international agreement to get things to happen. And the thing that happens in the wader world, and I don't think it happens in, with, with, other, uh, with other groups of birds, let alone other taxa, is that the, the time between science and action is small because it's the same people who, devolved, who are involved in all these things. So therefore there's very little lag between science and policy. And we saw that in the Yellow Sea. Uh, a, a recent paper showed that we were losing half of the waders that winter in Australia of many species such as these great knot. And the thing that, we, that was noticed is that they were, they were disappearing very fast and because survival rates were suddenly dropping. So the number, uh, the percentage of birds dying each year was going up. Now these birds are doing very long migrations. Uh, the uh, great knot are going from Australia up to the very far northeast corner of uh, Siberia in Russia. Uh, and there are species uh, such as Bartel God, which are going from New Zealand right the way through to Alaska. These are very long distances. And it isn't surprising if things get tough, if we start to lose out on birds. But the great thing is the good news for waders is that because the science was produced, because there was incontrovertible evidence that there was having huge event, uh, effects on international scale wader numbers, there is now much better protection for China's mudflats. And in fact, some of the, some of the illegal, uh, some of the regionally illegal uh, mudflats are, are being reinstated uh, because China is very keen to, 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 be, to be greening up their, their estuaries. And we're seeing the same stories in North Korea and South Korea. So we've already lost half the birds and it's unlikely that they'll come back, but at least there's some hope that the numbers won't go down any further. Another species that uses the same flyway, the East Asian Australasian flyway, is the spoon's eel sandpiper. They don't go as far as Australia in this case. They, they just uh, go to adjust. They just fly from Russia uh, to, down to uh, Bangladesh or, or Malaysia. Uh, but what scientists have been able to do here is to reveal the detailed patterns, uh, as you heard, of, post, of the migration of spoonbill sandpipers by using tagging devices. And what that's done is it's, it's revealed important wintering sites and staging sites for these very threatened species. Remember, there are only 600 of them left in the world. So the fact that we now know where they're wintering means that there can be a focus uh, to their conservation. And what's happening here is not only is there site protection, but also there are alternative jobs are being produced for hunters um, uh, who were previously hunting these shorebirds. Um, and there's much better uh, knowledge of how fishing, fishing, line, uh, fishing nets can take these birds as well. So evidence, action, and delivery. 
couple of recent, uh, another recent tale uh, about uh, another tracking study, which will hopefully, hopefully help to conserve a species. The sociable lapwing, lapwing which breeds in Kazakhstan. Uh, what the scientists first knew was that the survival rate of adults was really, really low. Now, normally, rate of survival is high, you between 70 and 90 percent. And for something the size of a social sociable lapwing, you'd expect it to be 80 percent a year. So in other words, you'd expect to see four out of five of your uh, ring social lapwings coming back in the next year. There wasn't anywhere near that number. Uh, and what the, what the theory is, uh, uh, backed up by evidence, is that there is huge hunting pressure in other areas. But the trouble was that a lot of the areas that these birds visited weren't known. So again, tracking has enabled to, has revealed these patterns uh, and that tracking and it will help to focus on conservation efforts to support these birds outside the breeding season. So let's hope that conservationists can now target illegal hunting. And that means the BirdLife International Partners uh, and other conservation organizations. Uh, I'm going back to black-tailed godwits just one more time. I talked to you about the head starting of black-tailed godwits. And in fact, in the first two years, the number of breeding pairs went up from 38 pairs to 45. So by putting this extra boost of uh, young black-tailed godwits into the uh, system, they came back and they bred and they're really boosting the population. Uh, the bad news is that we know from tracking, uh, many of them use the Tagus estuary, uh, which is a site of a proposed new airport for Lisbon. Um, and uh, there is a huge threat to this superb project because of, the, uh, because of that development. And that brings together two threads of this talk. The first is, how can you support breeding waders? But the second is, when you've got breeding waders that migrate vast dist distances, how can you support them in different countries they visit? Whether that be the uh, estuary in, on the Tagus, or whether it's uh, the development in West Africa to increase uh, food product production, uh, especially for countries such as China, which have invested so heavily in Western Africa. Because we have this interesting story where China is looking to uh, promote uh, the, a green economy in China, uh, but still uh, developing quite intensive farming across formerly very uh, rich habitat areas in West Africa. So that's just, I'm sorry, it is just a very quick run through. Uh, if you want to see any of this stuff, then if you're really interested in waders, you'll already be a member of uh, the International Waders Study Group. Uh, there are these Wader Tales blogs that I produce, which take the latest uh, stories, uh, latest science stories, uh, and turn them into articles, which I aim at bird watchers, not just scientists. Um, and if you want to know what's coming up, there's uh, the next three blogs are all waiting for papers. So you'll be able to hear about the migration or read about the migration of Swedish, Swedish great snipe, the rapid decline of in numbers of uh, Dunlin in the Baltic, and the third one is, oh yes, a fascinating insight into curly migration using tags. So those are the next three coming up just to add, and you can find all about what I do and what is on Way Details by following me on Twitter. Thank you. Magic, thank you, Graham. That was brilliant. Um, just as a reminder to people that the contact information um, will also be distributed in the, the follow-up email. And um, Graham, I'm not sure how it works in terms of sharing a Twitter feed, but would it maybe be possible to share a link to that with each other so that we can also distribute it in the follow-up email? Yes, I will do. Uh, so it, yeah, it's easy. I, I'll just send you, um, a, so you can share a Twitter feed in a Facebook page, so that's fine. Brilliant, okay. Thank you. Um, did anyone have any questions? see if anything comes into the chat. There's a thanks from Julio saying, um, great presentation, researchers need more people like you to communicate their findings, which is true. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. More thanks coming in from Nigeria. From <laughs>